Welcome to Dear Prudence. I'm your Prudence, Janae Desmond Harris. Today, I'll be answering questions about how to develop social skills, dating someone with PTSD, and awkward gift exchanges. To help me answer these questions today, I'll be joined by John Quillen Hill. John Quillen Hill is the host of The Weeds, Vox's podcast for politics and policy discussions. Prior to joining Vox, she was a senior producer for WAMU and NPR's 1A, where she was a member of the team that helped launch the show and produce segments on everything from Cardi B to the National Congress of the Chinese Communist Party. So I want to share a few tweets that might help listeners get a sense of who she is outside of work. Number one, I went to a rage room and did a number on a refrigerator with a baseball bat, and now my arms are sore. Number two, it's probably because I'm grown grown now, but I never realized how angry people get at others over choices like not having kids or being single or any other major adult life decision. I'm not sure where the anger comes from. Number three, I cook, I clean, I never smell like onion rings. I really could make his house a home if he'd let me. That last one was about Jonathan Majors. Jonathan, if you're listening, you know where to find her. Anyway, John Quillen and I will dive into your questions after a quick break. Welcome back. You're listening to Dear Prudence. And I'm here with John Quillen. Hi, JQ. Hey, it's so good to be here. Thank you so much for coming in to help me answer some of these questions today. Of course. Life is uh, very tricky and very complicated, so I'm happy to help out. Thank you so much. With that, let's dive right in with our first letter titled, Nothing to Contribute to the Conversation. I feel the only people I can talk to are either sick I'm a nurse, or school-aged, I'm a literacy tutor. For most of my life, I never had any real close friends. I just don't know how to talk to people, but I'm a very good listener. When I was a child, my parents didn't allow us to go to other people's houses because they thought we should be home studying. They didn't have any friends, and we don't have relations with extended family even though we all live in the same town. I used to cry in high school because I didn't have any friends. I lived at home until I was 30 years old. They did not allow me to leave until I got married. Many times, I blame my parents for my lack of meaningful friendships. Now, I'm pushing 50, pursuing entrepreneurial endeavors and discovering that networks and friendships are vital. Please tell me how to develop social skills so I can finally have some friends. You know, I have to admit the first thing I thought when I read this letter was, you're 50? You can't still be reeling from not being allowed to have sleepovers as a child. You have to get it together. But then I also thought, this is very real. The way we're raised sticks with us for a long time, and there's no magical point where you become a grown-up and heal all your wounds and just like shed everything bad that's happened to you. I really feel for this person. And I think we get a lot of letters about how to make friends, and I thought it was interesting that this is a slight twist on that. The letter writer is asking how to develop social skills so I can have some friends, which I think is like very insightful that you don't just get friends. You need skills to make friends. JQ, what do you think some of those skills might be? Okay, so full disclaimer, I moved around a lot as a kid and I'm an only child. Me too. And because of that, I feel like it makes you a professional friend maker Mm -hmm. because you sort of have to, when you get uprooted or you don't have siblings, you kind of have to develop these skills. And one thing that I really appreciated about this letter writer is that they said they're a very good listener. And I feel like that is one of the biggest social skills that are so important for making friends. And I think that they should put more weight on that. It takes practice, like with anything. Like, okay, you're working on these entrepreneurial things. That gives you a chance to go out and meet people. And people say it all the time, and it's corny to some. But, you know, find a hobby. Do you like knitting? Do you like pottery? Do you like cooking? Go to a class. 
listen to those people and then, you know, find something you have in common and start the conversation there. I also think one of the keys to making and keeping friends and keeping those social skills is follow up. So it's really easy to go out and meet someone and say, oh, we should totally hang out. We should get coffee sometime. Actually follow through and get the coffee. That's such good advice. Also, I wonder what you think about this tactic that every journalist uses. So I'm sure it's familiar to you. Whenever we're socially uncomfortable, we just start interviewing someone, right? Yes. So I totally fall back on this. If I ever feel like a bit awkward or I don't know what to talk about, you simply ask people about themselves and they absolutely eat it up, right? Everyone loves answering questions about where they're from, what they do, how they feel about their career, how they grew up, their perspective on life. That can keep you going for a long time. And you can kind of ride on that for a while before you even really have to like share anything about yourself or offer anything besides making the other person feel good by putting the spotlight on them. Exactly. I think follow-up questions are so important. And maybe, I don't know, maybe this is me telling on myself, but I think going on dates is essentially just an interview. And I think meeting new friends at first is essentially just an interview. Mm -hmm. So it's asking those questions, following up, and then thinking, okay, what's something we have in common? If I meet someone from a certain city, I may be like, okay, well, do you like this sports team? This particular team is my favorite. Or, you know, what is your favorite food? Oh, I love that. Or, oh, where do you like to travel? I've never been there. I would love to go. So I think this person is on the right track with listening. It's just asking those follow-up questions and keep going. Yes, I think that's really great advice. And just to emphasize, take the focus off of yourself because I feel like you have a lot of sensitivity totally understandably about the way you were raised and how you feel different than other people and you feel flawed to avoid really fixating on that and like bringing that to a social interaction just put the focus entirely on the other person to start and I think that will get you to a place where you're actually able to connect a little bit another piece of advice I have and I'm always saying this in friendship questions um, and JQ you and I both love Twitter so maybe you'll agree with me social media is so good for making friends And so many people are socially awkward um, and you can meet them. There's Twitter, there's Instagram, there's Reddit communities where you can meet people who have so much in common with you and you can be weird in your own home and take your time to come up with what you want to say and be open about your insecurities and find people who kind of relate to you or might feel just as weird as you do. So like, don't be afraid to meet people from behind a computer screen. It's not being a coward. It's not a subpar way of making friends. It's a legitimate way to start going about this. I was recently at a wedding where probably at least a third of the guests met the bride from, you know, old live journal days back in the early aughts. And it really is such a great way to meet friends. And I don't want you to get too in your head because a lot of people probably feel just as socially awkward as you do. And, you know, we just we don't talk about it often. So it's okay that you feel that discomfort. But again, it's the key is to not fixate on it. And you never know, you may make a friend by finding out that you have that in common. That's so true, especially this is the perfect moment for this letter because coming out of the pandemic, so many people feel so weird. Um, I know that I have caught myself feeling like I've lost the skill of making small talk. I'm not sure like how to chit chat at a party um, or talk to a stranger. And I used to be really good at that. So I think this is a moment where a lot of people are probably feeling just as weird as you are. And so you can kind of lean into that. Also, finally, I would just say there's obviously um, some healing that needs to be done around your childhood. And it sounds like it was a really lonely and really painful time for you, whether it's therapy or whether it's journaling or just talking to some of the friends you might meet about that. I would just suggest trying to kind of forgive yourself for what you didn't experience or what your parents didn't let you experience or like the different upbringing you had and try to kind of take a step away from that and leave it in the past. It does not have to characterize um, all of your interactions going forward. I also think adulthood, oddly enough, is sort of this chance to sort of take back maybe these moments you had in childhood. Like, for instance, I think sort of a more surface level way to think about it is, you know, growing up, I wasn't allowed to have Dunkaroos, so I'm going to go out and buy a bunch of Dunkaroos. But now you can go to friends' houses and you can, you know, 
make a friend and be like, you know what, girl or guy, whatever, like, let's have a sleepover. Like, let's do all of Mm -hmm. the things that I couldn't when I was a kid. You are now in control. You have the driver's seat. And now you get the chance to make all of those experiences happen for yourself. I absolutely love that idea. Give yourself the childhood you didn't have. Be a kid again. It's never too late for a sleepover. You're listening to Dear Prudence, and when we come back, more letters from you and hopefully some helpful advice. Stay tuned. Can't get enough Dear Prudence? Then you should definitely join Slate Plus, Slate's membership program. You'll get to hear me answer an extra question every week just for members. With your subscription, you get ad-free listening across the Slate network and unlimited reading on the Slate site, including all Dear Prudence columns, past and present. Go to slate.com forward slash Prudy Plus to sign up. It's just $15 for your first three months. Again, that's slate.com forward slash Prudy Plus. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Whether you're driving, cooking, or doing laundry, Progressive knows the podcasts you listen to go best when they're bundled with another activity, much like how their Progressive home and auto policies go best when they're bundled. Having these two policies together makes taking care of your insurance easier and could help you save, too. Customers who save by switching their home and car insurance to Progressive save nearly $800 on average. That's a whole lot of savings and protection for your favorite podcast listening activities, like going on a road trip cooking dinner, and even hitting the gym. Yep, your home and your car are even easier to protect when you bundle your insurance together. Find your perfect combo. Get a home and car insurance quote at Progressive.com today. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $793 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Welcome back to Dear Prudence. I'm here with JQ, and we're back to read more of your letters. This letter is titled, PTS Desperate. I realize this question will make me look terrible, but I need help determining whether I can ethically end my engagement due to my fiancé's mental health problems. Mike and I have been together for two years, but have been friends for nearly 15 In many ways, he's a wonderful man, funny, generous, and absolutely brilliant. We founded and run a publishing company together, and sharing this aspect of our lives feels like what I was always meant to do. However, Mike has PTSD stemming from some childhood trauma at school. In the fall of 2021, a violent chance encounter seemed to kick up his symptoms by several notches, and now it's running our lives. Actually, Mike cannot live his life anymore. He spends most days literally lying on the ground, moaning about how broken he is. When I suggest a new therapy, he tells me indignantly that he will never recover from his traumas and that there's no point in trying. Worst, he spends many, many hours each day ruminating over ending his life. He's also incredibly angry that his loved ones haven't responded to him tenderly. But the truth is that Mike's driven away friends, family, and clients. He's grown hateful and accusatory and is often unable to conduct a conversation without screaming at the person, although oddly never once at me, a list of ways they have failed him in his time of need. It doesn't compute to him when I explain that no one wants to subject themselves to such treatment and it's no wonder he's being avoided. In response, he has literally shrieked, I demand my sister's, my uncle's love right now. Shockingly, this tactic has not worked, but he's still as angry, as blamey, and as accusatory as ever. I suggest that he needs a specific type of counseling to learn how to put some of these hurts behind him and move on. Mike is enraged at the very idea, wondering why he, the victim, should have to do any of the work. He tells me I have no idea about how insidious trauma can be. Prudy, I have no desire to compete in the trauma Olympics. But the fact is that I have been violently raped multiple times by multiple perpetrators. I lost my father young and in a traumatic way and lost the use of my legs in a terrible, messy accident. I have been through hard times. I suffer from depression myself, but I prefer not to let these few negative episodes dictate my life. I cannot relate to my partner's attitude, and I'm close to not being able to empathize with it much either. I have done my darndest to get him help. 
We have tried six different doctors, two therapists, and two different psychiatric hospitals in voluntary commitments for the suicidal ideation. I have been told all my life that I am an unusually patient and empathetic person. I've spent this time since the violent encounter showing empathy for the specific triggering events he experienced, lovingly and gently pushing back on Mike's most delusional assertions and reminding myself that I'm seeing him at the very worst part of his life. But I'm so tired. He's been so mean to people who love him and are trying to help him that I've lost respect for him. Our company is suffering. His parents are at their wits end. I am sapped utterly drained and not myself anymore. I wish so much that one of these treatments we've sought out would work. He used to be a great guy, happy, supportive, nurturing, and open-minded. My latest request is for him to check in voluntarily to a boutique therapy institute for like a month. He absolutely refuses. I know he can't help having PTSD, but he seems determined not to heal. I'm starting to lose myself. My question is, can I leave this relationship with a clear conscience? So I think one of the very saddest situations someone can face is dealing with a loved one who desperately needs help with their mental health and won't get it. Just like a disclaimer before this answer, we're not going to solve this for you. It's one of those really, really tragic, unsolvable situations. But to answer the question asked, yes, you can leave this relationship with a clear conscience. Guess why? You're not helping him at all by being with him. You don't have what it takes. Nobody has what it takes. He's not going to be worse off without you because he's bad off for reasons that don't have anything to do with you. The best line I read in this letter was that his parents are involved. You can, with a clear conscience, hand him off to his parents and his brother, who's also there, and wish him the best. You can also choose to continue to be there as a friend if you want to, but this relationship isn't a relationship anymore. And anyone would understand, even Mike himself would probably understand, that it just can't go on. Yeah, I want you to know that you can walk away. And in fact, I think most of the time, if you would like to leave a relationship, just about all the time, like it is okay to walk away. Anytime, really. Yeah, anytime. And it hurts to see a person you love hurting. But it seems like in this scenario, a person you love is going to hurt no matter what. And walking away will be painful the same way staying is painful. But you have a choice to make that is all your own. But if you make the choice to walk away, you are well within your right to do so. You have no reason to feel guilty. You have no reason to feel responsible. You've done everything you can do. I also think you owe it to yourself and your loved ones to take care of yourself emotionally. So it sounds like this relationship is taking an enormous toll on you. And you don't want to be the next person who's in a situation as bad as Mike's. And it sounds like you've been through a lot and you have a lot to deal with yourself and you have to like put yourself first. You don't want to look up in a week or a year and your parents are asking these questions about you. You know, how do we get her help? She's totally hopeless. She won't do anything to improve her life. So do for yourself what you wish Mike would do for himself which is to do what it takes to be mentally healthy. And for him, that might be going to this special boutique inpatient treatment program. And for you, it's leaving this relationship. It's that airplane oxygen mask analogy, you know? Yes. You gotta, you have to put on yours before you can assist someone else. If it's draining you, and not only draining you, but you've tried to help. You've given suggestions. You've said, hey, like, let's do this. And It's not working. It is okay to walk away. And I'm glad that you asked us because apparently no one else in your life has given like this sense of permission to do what's right for you at this time. So I just want to be the one to say, yes, you can leave with a clear conscience. Um, It's hard. It's tragic. It doesn't mean it's going to be a happy ending, but I think it's the best thing you can do right now. This is Dear Prudence. We need to take a break, but when we come back, more letters from you and advice from us. Stay tuned. Okay, we've reached our last question. JQ, are you ready to give out one last nugget of wisdom? Absolutely. This letter is titled, Thanks But No Thanks. 
Over the last several years, family members have given my husband and me a Christmas gift from an organization to which we are ethically opposed, specifically factory farmed meat. We are meat eaters, but only buy from local farms, or if buying in the market, carefully check the animal welfare ratings. We've mentioned this, but we aren't around family regularly. We live on opposite sides of the country, so it's very possible they don't remember. We haven't said anything because it's a gift, and we don't want to be jerks. The way we've handled it is by donating the items, but that doesn't feel great because this company has still made money. The only solution I can think of is to tell family we don't want any gifts for Christmas, though we all enjoy gifting during the holiday season, so it might come off sounding strange. Are we being ungrateful a-holes? Should we make it a point to express our concern about factory farm meat at a later date? This still feels tricky. Any advice? I don't know. I will say this goes to my argument that I'm always making, which is that adults just have to stop giving each other Christmas gifts <laughs> and probably birthday gifts, too. It's ridiculous. Like, just take your $50, $20, $100, whatever it is. Everyone buy yourself what you want and stop with all this miscommunication, disappointment, irritation and everything else. Um, I'm honestly torn about this. I kind of want to say, like, it's a gift. Just take it. It's not that big a deal. But I think that's reflecting my judgment that factory farming is not the worst thing in the world. And if these people were receiving gifts of, like, crisis pregnancy center paraphernalia or, like, Trump hats, I would be like, no, tell them you don't want that. Send it back to them immediately. So I think I'm biased because I'm like, I know factory farming is not the best thing in the world, but also get over it. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. Okay. Well, again, this is not my personal hill I would die on because I it's just not something I think of. But I will say, so at one point in time, I was a pescatarian for seven years, which was dietary restrictions. I think this is a dietary restriction for you all. I don't think it makes you a jerk at all to say like, hey, guys, just so you know, like, mm, we don't love this company. We're trying a new thing. Like, we love receiving stuff from you every year, but like, we don't necessarily, you know, want this particular thing. And if that means you don't get a gift, that's fine. If it means they give you a gift card to something else, that's fine. I think it's good to speak up, like be, you know, forward about it. You don't have to be a jerk about it, but just, you know, say, hey, like, we don't eat factory farmed meat. And for all you know, that could start a conversation. Maybe other members of your family will see your point and do the same thing. I think it's okay to speak up and also to be prepared like, okay, maybe people will think we're jerks and it won't be received well. But in the grand scheme of things to get into it with your family over, I think this is, you know, very small potatoes. Okay. I like that. I don't know why it didn't occur to me to just like tell the truth. Um <laughs> Because gifts are weird. Like, you feel like, ooh, like someone gives it to you and, like, you are grateful that they thought of you. But if you hate it, you're like, I don't know what to do. Right. So I think the way they should deliver this message that these gifts are not welcome is using the old shit sandwich tactic that people use when they give negative feedback at work. When you're being, like, a little difficult or you're sharing something that's hard to hear, you want to sandwich it between two pieces of bread, which are really nice things. So I think the message has to be, like, thank you so much for thinking of us. We really, really appreciate the gifts. It's actually so generous of you to take the time to send that to us. We have to say we really don't eat factory farmed meat. Then also throw in a little bit of self-deprecating stuff, too. So it's like, we know that we're really extra about this stuff. And we just thank you for your patience with us because it's a bit high maintenance. But we would probably just prefer not to receive this meat and not to support a company that does this. Again, we're so sorry. We know this is very awkward. And we're just so lucky to have you as relatives because you're so generous to us. So thanks for putting up with us on this topic. We just, like, really appreciate you. And... Honestly, I kind of like the fact that they've been donating it. So you could even say, instead, why don't you just, like, donate to one of our local, like, food pantries? Like, even a cash donation just to, like, keep families fed. I don't know. There's there's lots of options here. Totally. I think this is going to be an awkward conversation, but it doesn't have to be a terrible one. Let us know what happens. Okay, those are all the questions we have for this week. As always, I sincerely hope we've been helpful. You know, when we asked JQ to come on, I knew she was the host of a podcast about policy. And I tried to find some questions about issues that would fit that expertise. 
didn't find any, but it turns out she's just as good on personal issues. So I really appreciate her for being here. Thank you so much, JQ. Thanks for having me. I'm glad I got to, you know, help some of the listeners out. I know you wanted to send a message out to Jonathan Majors. Oh, yeah. I want him to know that I smell real good. And I like poetry. He writes poetry. I'll I'll read his poetry. I wanted to make sure you had an opportunity to share that. Um, (laughs) Jonathan, again, if you're listening, find her on Twitter. Go listen to JQ on her Vox podcast, The Weeds. It takes a deep dive into the policies shaping our world, from immigration to climate change to crypto and more. It comes out every Tuesday. Do you need help getting along with partners, relatives, coworkers, and people in general? Write to me. Go to slate.com forward slash prudy. That's slate.com forward slash P-R-U-D-I-E. The Dear Prudence column publishes every Thursday. And you can join us for the Dear Prudy live chat on Mondays at noon Eastern. If you'd like to hear your question answered on the podcast, we're looking for letter writers who would be comfortable recording their question for the show. You can stay anonymous. Dear Prudence is produced by Sierra Spragley Ricks. Editorial help from Paola De Verona. Daisy Rosario is Senior Supervising Producer, and Alicia Montgomery is Slate's VP of Audio. I'm your dear Prudence, Janae Desmond-Harris. Until next time, 